Hey everybody, this is Aubrey Chavez from Faith Matters. I couldn't be more excited about today's episode. This is actually somebody that we've wanted to get on the podcast for years. Peter Enns. Pete is a well-known Bible scholar and the Abram S. Clements Professor of Bible Studies at Eastern University in Pennsylvania. In recent years, Pete has become well-known for several highly popular books, including How the Bible Actually Works, The Bible Tells Me So, and the book that we discussed with him today, The Sin of Certainty. In addition to his research and writing, Pete co-hosts the podcast, The Bible for Normal People. In The Sin of Certainty, Pete opens up about his own faith journey, including what he calls uh uh-oh moments. These moments that, as Pete says, wreak havoc with our neatly arranged thoughts about God, the world, and our place in it. He makes the argument that a faith preoccupied with correct thinking can quickly become exhausting as we try to fit our uh uh-oh moments into our previous ways of thinking and believing. Pete insists that there's a different way, the way of listening to our uh uh-oh moments and learning from them and even letting them change us and finding that our faith can transform from a rigid certainty about God to a radical trust in God. We really think that you're going to enjoy this conversation and we're so grateful to Pete for coming on. And with that, we'll jump right in. Well, Pete, thank you so much for being here. And one place that we thought would be really good to start would be to talk about the title of this book that we're here to talk about, The Sin of Certainty. One thing, especially in our religion, but I think across uh, you know, all religious perspectives is, or not all, but many religious perspectives, is there's a real championing of certainty, um, a real value around around knowing. And when you see a lot of people of deep faith, it seems that they might describe what they what they're feeling as something very close to knowing. So this the title of this book is very provocative when you look at it in that sense. And we would just wonder if you dissect it a little bit. First of all, certainty. What's the problem with certainty? And why would you describe it even as a as a sin? Could you get into that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, there's really not a, a a problem per se with feeling certain as long as we hold that lightly because then that could become its own immovable thing right and and if that happens i think what i what i've seen happen has happened with me it happens with many people is that uh then you have a faith that essentially never changes and I think the problem with not a faith that doesn't develop or move or evolve, if you'll allow that term, is that, you know, God is bigger than us. God is bigger than our minds. God's bigger than our experiences. And I think God is always out ahead of us. So when people feel a sense of certitude, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced uh, about X, Y, and Z about Jesus, that's, that's just religious faith. The sin of certainty is when uh, people feel uh, maybe some doubts or some questions coming up that that uh, hurt their sense of certainty, and then their only job is to get it back. Mm-hmm. I have to get back to the way it was. And you know, the metaphor that's often used is a brick wall. The wall's crumbling, and you need to build it back up again. And I think when we do that, we're actually missing an opportunity to live into the fact that God is never captured by our theological language. That's, that's my belief. Um, so I, I think that's important. And it's, and it's even more of a sin, I think, when leaders insist on that in their people to their own detriment. And I think that's really just basically putting millstones over people's necks and having them carry that around. It's a burden Mm -hmm. rather than, listen, I don't know everything. And the things I used to know, I'm not so sure about. And I've wanted to normalize that for for people of faith, that this is it's normal to not have certainty about things because we're just human beings. Yeah. And the, the word sin itself, have you had some evolution in your life? In, in terms of how you think about that word. I, I think the, the stereotypical version is, you know, a, a breaking of some arbitrary rule that, that God has ordained and thus, you know, you're bringing on God's wrath and, uh, and there's a need to sort of get back in line. Is that, is that what you're saying when you, when you use that, that word in this, in this book? No, not really. I mean, cause I think that's one way of thinking of the nature of sin, which has, it has some biblical backing, you know, let's not kid ourselves. But from my point of view, it, it's, it reflects the antiquity of the text and the context in which those stories were written. 
So I want to take those seriously, but it's not all that there is. Um, yeah, I, this is a big question here, uh, uh, Tim and Aubrey, and I want to sort of like be careful how I phrase this because I, I, it may be misunderstood. But I, I think we've actually learned some things about the human condition over the past few hundred years that I, I think not everyone would have known back, you know, a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago. And I like the language of Thomas Keating. Thomas Keating was a uh, Roman Catholic contemplative leader who just died a few years ago. Um, there's a retreat center in Colorado called Snowmass, which is the name of the town that it's in. And uh, Thomas Keating would talk about God as the divine therapist. Uh, the Orthodox think of um, God as a, a more of a healer than as a legal entity, like a judge, which is very common in, in evangelicalism to think of God that way. So, uh, but Thomas Keating, um, God is a divine therapist, and what God is interested in doing is healing us from the inside out. Um, to me, that's not uh, a, a sinfulness that uh, elicits God's anger, but it's an act of God's love for God's creation. And so I, I do think about sin differently than I might have articulated, say, 20, 30 years ago. And uh, it's a lot of because of experiences that I've had and things that I've just come across and things that I've read, um, which I know is is not the most traditional Christian thing to say about, about sin, but you ask anybody that question, what does sin mean? And all of a sudden we're off and running in the race at the races because there are different, you know, biblical metaphors for sin. It's, it's a weight that you bear. It's a stain that has to be, um, uh, you know, washed off or something. It's a debt that has to be paid. And those are all cultural metaphors that are trying to wrap their heads around this notion of what does it mean to be not aligned with God properly, I guess, you know, and, yeah. and, and so the question of sin, I think is, is a, is an interesting theological question. Just what is it? Um, and, and, and then, you know, how do we live in response to that? Yeah. Yeah. More, I really like that. And the, just to follow up really quickly, the more I thought about this title, the more I, the more I loved it because one of the ways that I've begun to think about sin in recent years is as sort of a, a anything that stops our progression. If you think of God taking on this parental role in in one way or another and desiring nothing more than for us to progress and and learn and and be better than we were yesterday, more more loving, you know, more whole, that and sin is what stops us from getting there. Certainty is something that is can really like once you're certain, like you're you're kind of done, you know, you feel right. like you don't have anything else to to do. And so right. in that sense, it really, it does seem like it, it can be a real sin that, that stops us from. Uh, well, I mean, just an process. example, I, I, I agree with that. I think an example would be something like uh, you feel a sense, whatever it is, but you feel a sense, I need to change something here in my life. But you don't do it because you're afraid. Mm. You're afraid of the uncertainty that it, that it brings. I think that's sin. I don't think God's mad at me. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the big yeah. difference. I think I'm holding back from the potential for growth and for change, which is what I think God wants for us we, to be continually developing or evolving or whatever word we want to use. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I think that that is an example to me of sin, but I don't equate that with the hammer of Thor coming down on my head any right. minute because. I got something wrong. It's just, I am afraid. I'm afraid right now. And yeah. that's holding me back. And the question then is not don't be afraid, but why are you afraid? What are you actually afraid of? And that's where wise people coming alongside you who know a thing or two, in our day, we call them therapists or spiritual advisors. They can help us understand what are you really afraid of here? And how can you explore what makes you tick and maybe then look for what, what is, where is the divine healing? Where can that come from in the midst of this? Right. So I don't mind calling that sin. I just want to yeah. uh, not have all the baggage with it, I guess. Yeah, totally. 
One one metaphor that we hear and, and use often in our tradition is this idea of a shelf, that anytime something comes up in your faith that is really hard to explain, or that feels especially it's causing a lot of dissonance, you're going to put it on the shelf and and stick with what you know, right? And I, I think that's what I'm hearing, like that that maybe is really coming from this place of fear, if we're really honest about it. And But I think that I think that um, this book really helps to sort of reorient how we talk about doubt like that. Like a lot of times, I think we, I think we've really learned to associate doubt with some sort of morality. Like if, if we're having doubts, if we're having questions that need to go on the shelf by entertaining those and holding them, we're actually choosing sin. We're choosing something. Right. We're choosing to make ourselves vulnerable to um, some sort of, it's some sort of spiritual weakness that is going to make our, our whole faith vulnerable. So how would you reframe the, these like, uh Oh moments, these like moments where we really, if we're being totally honest, are experiencing real questions that we didn't choose, but that we're, that we have. Yes. Um, and I think that's really well put. Uh, I would say this, that those uh uh-oh moments where, you know, everything's going along rather nicely and then something happens. It doesn't matter what it is. It's just, you could be watching something, streaming something on TV, or you could be reading a book or just talking to a new neighbor who's like an atheist and is the nicest person you ever met in your life or something like that, you know, Mm -hmm. where, the 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 paradigm we have this the narrative of faith that we have gets very much disrupted and i think when that happens to to look at it as not an attack on the faith from like some outside source but actually something that you're intuiting on the inside and it's not because you're caving into unbelief it's you don't necessarily want to go in this direction, but there it is. And it's a matter of integrity to explore it. And, yes. and I think, I just think God has to be okay with that because, you know, God knows us and, and God is infinite and we're not, and we are finite people. And all of us have theological problems. All of us have things that we're just not seeing. And we probably, in every area of our theology, there are things, we have blind spots because of where we live and when we live and our, you know, our race and our gender and our socioeconomic status and whether we're rural or in the city or living in Finland or, you know, in Taiwan, it just, it makes a difference. And, and we're going to have different uh-oh moments in our lives. And all of them, I think, uh, can be understood as that that time to it's time to get up and move a little bit here and stretch mm-hmm. your legs because you know your your faith in the infinite god of love is on autopilot well that's ridiculous if you think about it you know like what? like like i've got it down now and nothing can touch this mm-hmm. i get it and if you disagree with me you're now the enemy you're a heretic because you disagree with me on this one thing. But, you know, when people go through their own, um, I guess, you know, we call them say deconstruction moments. Um, that's when they have, they're not prepared for that. They have no, um, there's no built in flexibility to their system. It's all or nothing. Yeah. And very often what happens is people like that just double down and they become less yielding. Um, or they just leave their faith entirely, which I don't blame yeah. them for, quite frankly. Yeah, um, that's another way to like relieve the dissonance. I I get that. Mm-hmm. Can you do? There's a reading um, on page 157. I, this feels like a great time for that. Okay. 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 <laughs> but doubt is not the enemy of faith, a solely destructive force that rips us away from God, a dark cloud that blocks the bright, warm sun of faith. Doubt is only the enemy of faith when we equate faith with certainty in our thinking. This to me felt like kind of the thesis of the whole book. Like this is where everything sort of hinges. Like if we, if we are expressing our faith as a list of perfect beliefs, then that feels very rigid and, and fragile. Right. And I, I love that the book sort of moved me into this idea that what if faith is actually just deep, deep trust. And then there's so much flexibility and doubt actually feels like an invitation to relationship with God instead of like this, this big spiritual weakness that is separating me from God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, it's, it's again, sort of, it's, it's easier to think this way 
if we don't have an image of God whose sort of default mode is anger, which a lot of Christians do have. I mean, I think if, and if you prod them a little bit, they might not think that, they might not say that, but if you prod them a bit, it's, they're really afraid of God being angry with them. And then, you know, when they die, sending them to hell because they don't have, you know, the certainty and and everything they should be certain about. And I think once that is taken off the table, I think it's easier to just look at it and say, I am, I'm truly trying my best. I struggle with these things, but I'm going to try to trust God anyway, which is not an easy thing to do. It's, this is not an easy solution because trusting God is, for many people, exactly the problem. But the alternative that faith is equated with a list of beliefs that you're certain about and you do not waver from them, that's a very unrealistic expectation to have from careful Bible readers, because the Bible is so diverse anyway, and it has different opinions on different things. And you can ask of the Bible, you know, what's the biblical teaching on X? And it's like, well, it depends on where you're reading. And and these authors clearly disagree with each other. So, so you know, this biblically based sense of certainty, I don't think the Bible gives us certainty. I think it gives us a um, sort of a quilt of beliefs or, you know, just a, a diverse set of, of uh, religious expressions that span over a thousand years. And we get to in, enter into that. But to suggest that we're going to derive from that certainty is, is I think, uh, setting us up for a big fall. So I've been in situations before where I've tried to, um, you know, in a church setting, you know, give a little bit of room for for doubt and and that's not been received well typically and it's very easy for uh bible readers and you know more broadly in our tradition other readers of other scripture to point to verses and say it's very clear that god doesn't like doubt i mean you could you could look at you know peter trying to walk on the water and jesus rebuking him and saying oh ye of little faith wherefore didst thou doubt you know mm-hmm. how do you, i and i so i guess i've been wanting to ask a bible scholar this for a long time how do you deal with doubt uh, when you're looking at it biblically and people are saying it's, it's never, it's never a good thing here. Well, I, I, I would say, I think, I think there's a difference between the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament and the New Testament and how this is handled. And again, I don't know if the explanation is going to make people feel any better, but the, the, my, my outlook is this, the New Testament was written over a pretty narrow period of time. And just for argument's sake, I'll say something like maybe about 45 to maybe about 100 uh, of the common era AD. And there's a sense of urgency in the New Testament. The New Testament writers, those who talk about it, you know, clearly felt they were living in the last days, that this is going to come to an end fairly soon. And so the the rhetoric of the New Testament is the urgency of the moment. In the Hebrew Bible, you have books like Ecclesiastes and Job and Lament Psalms. And you have the Hebrew Bible that was written over about roughly a thousand year period of time. Most scholars say from about 1200 to about 200 BCE. And during different times, different political moments, uh, different historical epochs, by different people, for different circumstances, different reasons. And you plenty of time during that thousand year period to reflect on, you know, things aren't going very well here. You know, um, you, you know, the, the, you don't have the sense of urgency in a, in a, in a, anthology of literature that spans so much time and see so how psalmists you know openly challenging god and you know where are you when we need you kind of thing and ecclesiastes saying the whole thing doesn't make sense and job casting serious doubt on what uh you know biblical scholars call the deuteronomistic theology the theology of the book of deuteronomy and of like samuel and kings where Things are pretty black and white. 
You obey and you're blessed. You disobey and you're cursed. You know, read, read the blessings and curses in, at the end of Deuteronomy. Um, you have in in the Hebrew Bible, you have these moments of um, of uncompromising fidelity to God and don't waver. Uh, Walter Brueggemann, the Old Testament uh, scholar, calls this Israel's main testimony. This is their main story. God saved you. Here's the law. Keep it. If you don't, there are consequences. If you do, there's blessing. But then you have these other portions of the Hebrew Bible that are what Brueggemann calls the counter testimony. It's like in a court of law where they come up and say, uh, excuse me, <laughs> um, I've done what I need to do my whole life and I'm suffering. And there are rich people over there who hate God and have all the blessings. Right. Or why isn't God here helping us when he helped the ancestors of the past? Or, you know, Ecclesiastes saying, like, nothing really makes any sense. This is absurd. The way God set up the world, it just doesn't make any sense. And Job refusing to believe in the orthodox theology of his friends. His friends were actually very orthodox by some standards that, you know, listen, suffering is a result of disobedience of sin your suffering clearly you must have done something to elicit this from god and job insists from beginning to end i didn't do anything and his friends say yeah you did and job says no i didn't and his friends say yeah you did and job says no i didn't and his friends say yeah you did it goes on for 30 chapters like that <laughs> but the point of the book at the end is that you know job is actually vindicated for holding his ground you know, at the end, God appears to Job and his friends, uh, you know, out of the whirlwind, and which is freaky enough. But it'd be nice if God <laughs> shows up and solves all our theological disputes. But he shows up here and he looks at one of Job's friends and he says, um, you have not spoken well of me as my servant Job has. Even though they're the ones doing the straight theological line from like Deuteronomy of blessings and curses, Job maintains his innocence throughout, and God is vindicating him for not giving in, you know. And so I would, for people who go to James, for example, you know, don't, don't waver in unbelief, I would counter that and say, but there's a whole tradition in the Hebrew Bible that does something very different, and we need to take that seriously too. And this is just an example of how you can't necessarily get the whole Bible on the same page on a given topic because there are different contexts, there are different reasons why James was writing what he wrote. Mm -hmm. And we have to be thoughtful as we engage this and not just take it on a proof text level, but say, how does this fit into the rhetoric of James as a whole? And what is James trying to say as a letter, right? But it takes a lot of patience to do that. And I, and I understand that not everyone is excited about that prospect of having to dig in. It's much easier just to take verses. But for every James, I have a psalm, mm. right? For every wow. first Peter, I have Job, you know? And it's like, this is, I think this is why the Old Testament is, you know, worth reading for Christians. And in part for that reason, it does things that the New Testament doesn't do. And we've been around for 2000 years now. We have a lot in common with the long stretches of time where the doubts start coming in. Yeah. Wow. This is this is kind of a pastoral question, but I think you know, a lot of times our faith really is built on this bedrock of intellectual argument. Like maybe I, I think it's an accident. You know, I don't think that we mean to approach faith that way, but sometimes we're presented faith in a way that is like someone sets up dominoes for us, you know. And right. so it when those start to fall and those correct beliefs start to become a little bit destabilized, then how do you hang on to trust? Like, how do you transition from this idea that faith looks like correct beliefs? To something that feels a lot more fluid if you if you don't have that foundation yet right and i i think it's very difficult and that's part of the problem with and i think you put it well aubrey there, it really is evangelicalism and fundamentalism are different but but still it's about believing the right things and if you do that you're going to be on solid ground if you doubt those things you're going to waver and you're going to fall away and the next thing you know, you might drink coffee or whatever you guys have a problem with over there. In the morning. <laughs> I went, by the way, side issue here. I went to BYU about seven, eight, nine years ago, and I spoke uh, with a couple of other scholars 
had a great time talking with the theologians there and also the biblical scholars there. But I just woke up in the morning and I should have Googled it, but I'm like, where's the coffee? And it's like, and I it just... That was okay. I made it. I you made know, it through. You know, back in that era, and when I, I went to college at BYU, there was actually no, there was no caffeine, like official caffeine of any kind on campus. You couldn't, you couldn't find a, a Diet Coke that wasn't caffeine free. That has since changed. You'd still, yes. it would still be pretty hard to come by some coffee, I will say, at BYU. This is such a, like, historic Jewish question, like, like, no caffeine, but what is caffeine? How do you define caffeine? And is it at certain times a day? It's like it's a very legal argument. I don't mean yeah. I don't mean that in a negative sense, more of an observation. Christians do the same thing about, yeah, can I miss church or something like that? Well, yeah. you know, why are you missing church? Well, you know, anyway, I, th I think when you're born and, and, and raised in an intellectualizing kind of what I would call a biblicistic an apologetically oriented faith, I think that transition doesn't happen very easily. I think the transition almost has to be very strong because that's the only way to press reset. There's no other option for, for, for maintaining some sort of Christian faith or faith or whatever faith, religion you have. So I, I think it's difficult. I, there's no like, well, here's how you do it. I think it's more Hopefully, as you live and breathe and engage other people and let the clouds settle, let the dust settle. And for many people, that means I have to get out of here. You know, I, I need to leave. I need to not look at my Bible for a while because it's been very toxic. Right. And I think it, it's it just it takes time. There's no I mean, when I think of my own path, for example, and how I left my own model of certainty because all of a sudden none of it made any sense and this was like back in 2009 and i remember just thinking to myself yeah, i'll never sing a christmas carol again or nothing i don't see any way back from where i am right now because none of that stuff makes sense and all i can say is that over the course of the next few months six months a year i just found myself in a different place, being interested in how other people have processed the Christian faith. And that got me involved in, at least interested in things like the Orthodox tradition or contemplative kind of Christianity, which is its own diverse thing. It's not just one thing. And I saw models for me that made a lot of sense, you know, and, um, can I tell a story here? Do you mind? Uh, it's, it's one of my favorite stories. Uh, it deals with Mother Teresa. Oh, and I yes. know a lot of people don't like her. And there are probably reasons not to like Mother Teresa. I have no idea. But, I can't um, imagine what those, those would be. Well, she's been accused of like keeping people in poverty so that they can suffer and God can have grace on them or something. And and uh, I, I'm I'm... I can't verify that at all. I've read her letters and it's very interesting stuff to read. But but anyway, uh, there was uh, this day I was in front of my computer and this was, um, I was in the middle of all this stuff, right? And I wasn't really teaching on a full-time basis and it was a little bit of a weird time. And I came across uh, a story between Mother Teresa and John Cavanaugh, who was a, uh, I think a moral philosopher at St. Louis University. He just died several years ago. And in the mid seventies, he was having his own crisis of faith, his own crisis of certainty and things like that. And so he thought he'd take a sabbatical time visiting mother Teresa because she'll know the answers. Right. So he shows up and, you know, he meets her and she says, what can I do for you? He says, you can pray for me. And she says, what, what can I pray for? And he said, um, pray that I have, um, I forgot clarity. the word that he used. Clarity. 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 I pray that I have clarity, not certainty, but clarity. And she said, um, I will not pray for that. And he goes, well, why not? Because clarity is the last thing you're clinging to. She uses that word clinging and must let go of. And I remember re just reading that story and the, the impact it had on me because I, I, I just thought of that. And I said, I think I've been doing this wrong, you know, because I've left a certainty system. And now I don't know where I am. And my whole thinking is all oriented around 
getting that certainty mm -hmm. system back. It may be a different certainty system, but it's a certainty system nonetheless. And that really challenged me about clinging to that sort of thing. And and that what's I think it's really funny is when John Cavanaugh said, well, you seem to have tons of clarity. And then she just laughed and said, I've never had clarity a day in my life, but I've had trust. So I will pray that you trust. And it, it hit me that I, I've been doing this wrong. It really, it struck me. It was almost like an epiphany. Like, I don't know the implications of all this, but seeking to be certain is not an act of trust or faith. Yeah. And what, trust and what faith a good don't point. always yeah. have a clarity to it. They have sometimes a lot yes. of unclarity. Yeah. Wow. If, yeah. If I could ask you, <clears throat> so, excuse me, um, sort of from a societal level. So the book, you know, centers around moving away from an emphasis on on correct beliefs. And I'm I'm wondering if we aren't I actually don't don't believe this, but I'm going to try to articulate an argument that I can imagine being made. Um, if we aren't focused on correct thinking, then isn't there a possibility that we're all we all just sort of end up creating God in our own image, and there's just utter relativism and chaos, nothing to center a society or, around? How would you how would you deal with that? Type of um, yeah, it depends on my mood and attitude at the moment. <laughs> um, one thing I might say is that um, we're always creating God in our own image anyway. Even if you're going to go strictly biblically, who you are as a subjective person affects what you read and how you read it, whether you're reading it in English or in some other ancient language. or It's, it's hard to escape the subjectivity of it all. And, you know, there's this great line I use all the time with my students. Um, I th It might have been Mark Twain. It might have been Rousseau, one of the two. But uh, in the beginning, God created man in his own image. And like gentlemen, we've been returning the favor ever since, right? And that's true. See, I think this is, this is theology. We do that. We're always meshing together the, 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 the essentially incomprehensive God steeped in mystery with our own limited human experience. That is the task of religious faith. That's a task of theology. No one escapes that. Right. So even the most ardent biblicist proof texter does not escape that because they're assuming, first of all, that's the right way to get to God, which I would contend is not the right way. But you're not getting certainty from a text that clearly seems designed not to give us that kind of epistemic, you know, intellectual history, uh, a certainty that we want. You know, so I, I would just basically, I wouldn't give that person the high ground. I'd say we're all actually on the same shaky place. Mm. And the task of faith really has a journey element into the mystery of God. Along the way, what we do is we formulate our thoughts, we systematize our thoughts, and we say, this is what I believe about God, or this is what my tribe believes about God. And all that's great. And it's actually inevitable everyone's going to have that but the issue is do we hold to it maybe gently uh with conviction that's fine I, say, I really believe this but then to be open to maybe adjustments to that or even wholesale changes and rejection to that if your experience is calling you to think through that you know and and that's, see, that's it, not to go on and on about this but i you know, a lot of my younger years in, in the church has been about vilifying human experience. Like, that's subjective. We want objective truth, but that's subjective. And plus, you're a sinner. So your experience <laughs> means nothing. Just your experience is the problem, not the thing we have to account for. And again, I want to say, who who transcends their own experience on this planet? Nobody does, right? We're always, our experience is always feeding into our experience of God, how we talk about God, the words we use to formulate our understanding of God, all that. It just, it can't be escaped. And mm -hmm. so I just, I reject the whole premise, actually, of that kind of discussion. Wow. I, I love how you put it in, in the book somewhere. You say that the problem is that the preoccupation with correct beliefs is that you, it holds God captive to what you are capable of comprehending. 
and which right. makes so much sense to me. Like I, in, in that sense, I can see how no matter where you are, you're creating God in your image because that's all you're capable of really. Right. But yeah, but I, but I, so I wonder like when you talk about agnosticism, are you just saying like, you're finally at a place where you really stop resisting letting God show you something new? Like, are, is it just like this place of such extreme openness that, that you can be taught or and I, I guess my real question is like when you are in this place of deep doubt like what is the next step is it just is it le to lean into doubt or to lean into whatever you can hold on to or you know what what do you what do you actually do in those moments where you feel like you have nothing you have nothing you have no I mean, it, it may be both of those things Aubrey. It, it may be leaning into what you have some connection with but then also leaning into the doubt itself because the 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 uh, opposite would be to flee from that moment yeah. and you know to you know go back into the fortress and close the door tight and sh and lock it behind you whereas that may be the thing that changes you the most if you're willing to sit with it but it's not always easy to sit with and i think to retreat a little bit and just catch your breath is fine you know uh i think having people around you that can relate to that experience or at least are open to understand that this is a part of the, the journey of faith i think that's very very helpful too the problem see the thing is when we tr think we have to do this on our own because you know i felt this too like i i started having a thought on something that i would never have thought 20 years earlier and it came out of nowhere and i'm like i think this is right but then it's like, I can't let anybody find out. Yeah. Right. And that's the hard part. I mean, we're not meant to do faith alone. I think we're meant to do faith in a, in a loving, nurturing context. And I know churches, I've never been to one like this, but I know churches that have like lament Sundays where all they do is talk about the crap that makes it hard to believe or if you believe at all. Right. Wow. Well. That's why I like liturgical settings where you recite things like creeds and whatnot. And even though half the people in the congregation are saying, yep, 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 nah, I don't know about that, I don't know about that, you're in a context where there's still belief happening all around you. And, okay, I'm part of this even though I have my doubts. I mean, some people say, I think Rachel Held Evans said um, something like it's uh, people— they they can help help believe for you at those mm -hmm. times right uh john levinson who is one of my professors in graduate school wrote a book uh, about this as well where he says that the the thing about liturgy is that when other things go away that liturgy can remain with you and it can help give some sort of an anchor to your life even mm -hmm. if you're not sure about how it all works right so i i think you know there's no easy solution to it um, but I think the way conservatism has been wired, you're setting yourself up for a major crisis. If you ever doubt anything, you're not supposed to do it. And you can't even talk to people about it. Yeah. yeah. I really like that, too, the, the, this idea that liturgy can be an anchor. And also maybe your past experiences with the divine can still be valuable, even if you lose those correct that correct thinking sure. because i think if if it has to be an intellectual argument then it's then the the sad thing is that like you deconstruct those experiences too because you th because right. they're not connected back to something logical and so i like this way of looking at faith because it means that you can still not be able to explain it and value it and you can still find value in the liturgy without being able to connect yes. every dot because this is a that, this I, is I agree with that. Of I yeah, think I that's really very well that. put and when um that's why experience is so important. And I've told many people who, you know, hey, Pete, I had this experience of God 10 years ago, but now everything I'm learning about the Bible undermines that experience. Yeah. And I always say the same thing. The experience was real, but you're just learning stuff. <laughs> you know, that doesn't mean the experience wasn't real. The experience doesn't depend on you having the right view of the Bible or the right systematic theology. The, the experience relies on God who, you know, the wind blows where it wishes, right? That's in John chapter three. That's, we have to remember that this is out of our control. And that's so encouraging, quite frankly, like I don't have to have it all right. 
And when experience is, is just undervalued or dismissed as actually literally satanic, you listen to your experience, you're listening to that sinful heart of yours. You know, I just, I don't know how people can recover from that because what are we if we're not our experiences? But this conglomeration of perceptions and, and false perceptions and, and uh, you know, imperfections and limitations, that's who we are. And you have to believe, at least, you know, in, in the Christian faith, you have to believe in a God who understands that and yeah. is not waiting to, you know, give us a D minus on a theology exam because we didn't hold to this thing somebody said 500 years ago. Yeah. You know? Com conversely, like, <clears throat> what about when God really feels just completely absent? Like, maybe you're also having these questions, but like, what happens when you're just not having any experiences? And it, it feels like, I, I think the dark night of the soul is the, is the word that speak or the phrase that speaks to everybody. Yeah. Like it just feels like he's or she, or they like God is gone. Like there is no God. Right. And what, how can that be? How can that still be part of this journey of faith? Well, I mean, I don't want to uh, give cheap advice because I think that is a real painful place to be where everything is just dark. And, you know, back to Mother Teresa, her her dark night of the soul, in her own words, lasted, I think, 47 years. And it was towards the end of her life when she started having more clarity. And I'd like to think that the good that she did might have happened sort of in concert with that dark night of the soul, because it maybe drove her to experience God in charity toward others which is a very bit that's you know first john chapter four no one has ever seen god but if we love one another right then god is in our midst kind of thing and um so i i think you know things can still come from that period of like total god abandonment what, what i think at least what my experience was i felt like i had to have that prolonged period of thinking that because the 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 reset that had to be pressed was big mm -hmm. and i think I, I mean you know this is what saint john of the cross and others say it's that when you feel abandoned by god you're not <laughs> you, you it feels like it but you know you're not losing god what you're losing is the god of your mind and sometimes it takes a lot of just resetting to discover something else. And I think for some people, and I want to say this, um, you know, because I've seen it many times, for some people, that period of reset means leaving faith entirely and processing things, you know, and, and I, I would say hopefully coming to see that their reasons for rejecting their faith are probably good ones, but God is beyond all of that and is still something where I think God approaches us primarily in our daily lives and our experiences. That's beautiful. Yeah. Is there any, is there anything else you'd like to leave us with or leave our audience with Pete? Um, yeah, I guess if people are uh, in that, place where they're not sure what and believe me i see this all the time mainly because we have a TikTok now and it's like that's all you see mm -hmm. and i understand you know, atheist channels agnostic channels and people coming over to our channel and talking about stuff and we see it and i and i get it and i honor it but i think um to to take this the, the down periods and try to accept them as a normal part of the life of faith and not an aberration that only the wicked or the bad or the lazy or the unconvinced or those who are listening to, you know, to like to have their itching ears tickled or something like that. Um, that's don't think that way. Just think that this is what, what do you expect to think anyway, at some point in your lives when you've been taught a fairly rigorous way of believing and then your experience simply it, it makes no sense of your experience at all. Right. That's going to happen. That is going to happen. And just to try to take it in stride and not think of God as being mad at you. Cause I don't think God is mad at you. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's all part of the journey. I really appreciate that. You, and we're just so grateful for both for all of your books, but um, most especially Sin of Certainty. And then, and we've we've found so much value in um, how the Bible actually works this year too, while we've been studying the Hebrew Bible. So, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Pete. Thanks, Aubrey. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate it. Thanks for your time. All right. Thanks so much for listening. And a huge thanks to Peter Enns for coming on the show. You can find all of Pete's books, including The Sin of Certainty on Amazon. And again, make sure to check out his podcast, The Bible for Normal People. And if Faith Matters content is resonating with you and you get the chance, we really would love for you to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen on. We read all of those reviews and it helps us to get the word out about Faith Matters. We appreciate the support. Thanks again for listening. And as always, remember, you can check out more at faithmatters.org.